Love Talk Radio. Welcome. You're listening to Perfectly Healthy and Tone Radio with your host, Darren Batman McDuck. And now, prepare to get back. What's cracking, peeps? Darren McDuffie here, alias Fat Man, helping you become perfectly healthy and toned and conscious, of course. That's my new thing of adding the consciousness part there because I think that with all that's going on right now, we need to be really aware and be a lot more conscious. Tonight we have another great episode. Hopefully you enjoy the episode that I released or uploaded Monday, um, I spoke with another pharmaceutical, former pharmaceutical rep, Gwen Olson. The name of her book is Confessions of an RX Drug Pusher or Prescription Drug Pusher, however you want to say that. Had a real lively discussion with her. And tonight we're going to conclude what I call Pharmaceutical Week. Um, Those of you who have been following the show for any amount of time know that I myself am a former pharmaceutical rep. I spent a little over two and a half years in the industry and uh, I believe that the gentleman's coming on the night spent five years. And uh, Gwen, who was the guest uh, for Monday, spent uh, a substantial amount of time uh, in the industry. But it's always good to talk to people who have relatable experiences. Tonight, I'm sure this is going to be another good episode. Just some housekeeping before we get on. Always, always, please connect with me on social media. Um, I haven't really been doing a lot on social media lately. I'm actually beginning to kind of uh, change over my website here in the next one or two months, and it's going to be totally geared towards the uh, podcast. So stay tuned for that, and um, I'll be doing some more things uh, pretty pretty soon here. So again, just connect with me on Facebook, facebook.com slash Perfectly Healthy and Tone Radio. I'm also on Twitter under the Fat underscore man. You can also find me on Pinterest as well. Probably can just use my name, my real name, Darren McDuffie, and find me on Pinterest. And you can also still friend me on Facebook under Darren McDuffie because I do still have room for friends there. But I would love if you actually friend the uh, the fan page as well because there are going to be some changes in there and we'll be doing some some great things. So before I get uh, Gerald on, let me read Gerald's bio. Gerald released is a certified nutritional consultant whose unique approach to whole food nutrition allows him to advocate reversal of, not just prevention, of health challenges brought on by poor nutrition. And as I mentioned before, he is also a former pharmaceutical rep. Gerald Ruiz, welcome to Perfectly Healthy and Tone Radio. How are you tonight? I'm doing, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Darren. Thanks for coming on, Gerald, man. I um, was so excited when we finally made a connection and you agreed to come on and um, got a chance to finish the book up. I actually finished it up a little bit earlier today. I didn't get a chance to really start reading it until a couple of days before, but really well-written book and really easy to read, I might add, and everything seemed to flow uh, flow really well within the book. So uh, kudos to you for writing a, a really good book. Um Wanted you to really, every time a guest come on, I ask them to uh, share their story. Um, obviously, right now you are a nutrition consultant, but give us your story of how everything started. How did you get from point A to point B? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I appreciate the feedback in the book. And if you have any you know, pointers on how I can make it um, you know, a, a, an even better tool to support others who are looking for a life of being optimally healthy and you know, drug-free, feel free to let me know. But I, yeah, I had I had attended UC Berkeley for my undergrad, and you know I was a double major, molecular cell biology and psychology. I was actually pre med and very much interested in in helping people. And uh, I, I continued, you know, I went through my school, I graduated, and I had shadowed a buddy of mine because you know while I was in in college, I realized that the current healthcare system is really governed by the HMOs or the health management organizations, the the insurance companies. You know, a lot of a lot of your listeners are probably seeing someone in which their health insurance co- health insurance company actually approves and says, "Hey, go to see this doctor, this type of care." And once I realized that business and money ruled how healthcare was driven, it, it made me look in a different direction. And I went on, and became a pharmaceutical sales rep, 
mm-hmm. just like you, I, I actually did it for five years, and, and I'm, you know, and, and it took me a little while to realize that something was wrong with what I did. But one evening, you know, I was out uh, having dinner with a high prescribing physician, medical doctor, and his spouse, and we were at one of the local wineries. And you know, you know, wineries they have the best restaurants, also the most expensive restaurants, and. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I had uh, got the bill, and you know, eating, eating at these type of restaurants is really no big deal. You and I both know that a lot of these drug companies have a, had a lot of money to spend and still do to invest in their marketing campaigns, and I literally would spend you know, $5,000 a month on food not having to pay a single dime because it was my employer who gave me the American Express corporate credit card. And, and so anyways, I'm eating this meal. And the bill comes, and it's $600 for three of us, you know, after tax and tip. And, of course, that doesn't faze me. It was just part of the job. Now, as a trained sales representative, I was trained by my employer to, to be a shark and to close for business. Because if I didn't mm-hmm. close for business, I wasn't increasing sales. And this was already a high-prescribing position. And, you know, when his spouse went off to the restroom and I paid the bill – I simply looked at the doctor and I said, Hey, look, doc, you know, um, there's an internal contest between me and my colleagues that ends in two weeks. And can I count on you to, you know, write 10 more prescriptions um, within the next few weeks so I can come out on top. And he looked at me and he said, yeah, anything, anything you need, buddy. And from there I generated more sales. Unfortunately, there are now 10 more people who didn't need that drug prescribed to them but they got it because of me closing this doctor. And, and on the drive home, I had, um, you know, I, I just, I did, something didn't sit right with me. I was driving home. I had this bad feeling in my gut. You know, initially I thought it was the fish, uh, <laughs> but then I realized, then I realized it was my conscience turning on. And, you know, I got into the industry of being a pharmaceutical health care rep, a pharmaceutical sales rep, to help people and where in fact I was actually doing the complete opposite. I, and, and so I made a conscious decision to leave the industry and unfortunately I didn't know exactly where I was going to go. So I went on for higher education and did my MBA in Asia where I got exposed to acupuncture, herbal medicine, detoxification, Qigong. I even participated in a five day silent meditation retreat up in the mountains in, in Taiwan with the Zen Buddhists. Um, I even got my first chiropractic adjustment from a Twainot practitioner who was phenomenal and helped me with some issues that I had out there. And, and I really turned my focus on what a true healthcare model really looks like. And when I returned to the U.S., I, uh, I became a nutritionist. And um, just really made that 180 degree shift to to being where I'm at now, working with clients who are interested in optimizing their health and living drug free you know lifestyles, and and then also teaching the process of how to do so to to my colleagues out there. And so I work with a couple thousand different holistic healthcare practitioners. That includes naturopathic doctors, chiropractors, acupuncturists, you name it, and even some medical doctors and, and osteopaths who are holistic and um you know and now we're all just having fun helping people just truly achieve optimal wellness and you know starting to become healthy and living drug-free lives just because they're eating optimally you know taking specific herbs as they need and moving right thinking right feeling right and uh yeah so that's kind of the uh, that's that's kind of the short story <laughs> i guess <laughs> yeah oh, oh, I guess yeah um I want to ask you this as a personal question because it, it came across as, um, for me, it wasn't until many years of really getting out of the industry that I was realized, I realized that I was brainwashed. Um, when I look back on everything that I experienced during that time, when I would look at package inserts, when I would look at competitors' drugs, and I would obviously see side effects and all these other things, but I was just taught to look over those things because I just thought that, you know, I was doing good. And obviously you had a call of consciousness. Um, when did you, was it that moment when you were riding back home that night and then you got that, that gut feeling that's when you realized that you might've been brainwashed? 
Yeah, you know, brain, <laughs> brainwashed <laughs> is a, a very strong word. word. Yeah. <laughs> it's a word. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I would like to think I always had free will on my side, mm-hmm. but, uh, you, you know, you, you're absolutely right to some level, you know, and, and for your listeners, I want, I want them to, to realize that, you know, everybody is doing the best with what they know, you know, whether yeah. they're a nutritionist or whether they're an acupuncturist or whether they're a medical doctor prescribing these pharmaceuticals to their patients, you know, everyone's doing the best of what they know. And I'm, and I'm by no way, you know, no, no way saying that we know everything, you know, we know, you know, the, the most amount of knowledge, not, not saying that in any way. Um, but we just know a different way, you know, and that's how I like to think about it because, you know, I have a lot of friends that I went to Berkeley with who are now medical doctors and, and they're actually my colleagues because they will help wean um, some of my clients off of certain medications when, when I ask them to. And, but they went to medical school to be trained to be doctors. And unfortunately, the system does prioritize pharmaceuticals, surgery, and radiation first, while you, know, you and I emphasize, well, well, let's look at lifestyle habits, such as eating habits, herbs, supplements as needed, um, movement therapy, you know, certain exercises, just getting out in nature. So, you know, what we've done is we've essentially um, found a different path. And, and, yeah, I guess there was a time I was cynical. You could say I was, I was brainwashed into believing that chemicals can be used as nutrition because that's what most people are doing. They're, they're eating and popping in chemicals and trying to address symptoms of starvation. Um, you know, and I was, I guess you could say I was part of that, that, uh, that mindset but, uh, yeah, you know, one thing out there, while you may have listeners who have been following along and, and making these lifestyle changes, there are those who are still taking pharmaceuticals. And, you know, and the proper way, I think, for them to just tap into us is to know that, hey, we're all doing the best with what we know. The cool thing is you and I, you know, we've seen that aside, and we can help these people transition into that healthier lifestyle knowing what we know. And that's the cool thing about it. Yeah. Yeah. Brain rice might have been like the, a harsh word, but um, Maya Angelou has a saying. She says, when you know better, you do better. And I always like to think that I had to go through that to get to this other point or get to the other side, you know, so to speak. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Um, when I was reading your book, one of the things that uh, came to mind or kind of made me reminisce is how I would walk in and I'm, I'm sure you would walk in as well and how you use fear to influence doctors. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, unfortunately, um, you know, pharmaceuticals are best. Actually, if you think about it, anything is sold with fear. You know, there's a lot of people buying cats in plastic bottles that now, you know, in the past would have BPA, no neurotoxin slash xenoestrogen, right? So people will buy water from in a plastic bottle instead of drinking the tap water because they're scared of what's in the tap water, right? But now we're finding out what's in the bottled water is just mm-hmm. as bad, and now we want to get um, spring water or, uh, you know, filters water. So so fear is a, is a tool to use really to sell a lot of things and sell anything. And, um, you know, for me, and being a drug rep, and I'm sure you can relate, you know, we'd go in. I, I used to sell it as antidepressant and some atypical antipsychotics, a lot of psychotropic medications where, you know, one of the common symptoms of someone who has a mood mood disorder or just not stable, then they, you know, they could potentially commit suicide. And that is, you know, a possible fear a medical doctor has when they see a patient and the patient in front of them is expressing symptoms of, of suicide. And of course, as a drug rep promoting an antidepressant, I'd go in and show them the marketing materials, which were very professionally made to tell a story. And I would show them the side of a very gray, is a black and white photo of a dejected person who looks sad. And I would say, hey, doctor, you know, if you got someone in your office who looks like this, or maybe they're crying uncontrollably, you don't want them to go and commit suicide, right? That's, that would be on your conscience. And, and knowing that you have the ability to turn their life around by giving them a prescription to this drug, you can change their, the out, outcome of their life. So the next time you see someone in your office, you know, don't be afraid to prevent a case, another case of suicide, you know, cause that, that could be on you. That, that would be on you if you overlook it. And so here's an opportunity to prescribe X, Y, Z or drug, you know, drug that I was promoting. And, 
You know, and we, so we tap into that fear and medical doctors are doing the same thing with their patients. You know, it's like, Hey, look, you know, we want to get control over disease. We don't want you to die of this, take this chemical. And, um, you know, so fear mongering, unfortunately is, was part of my lifestyle back then when I was a pharmaceutical sales rep. And unfortunately it's, it's it's to a minimum as to what I do now because now it's a matter of showing people the the direction that they should be going in, which is you know a vibrant life, doing the things that they want to do with their family members, and and having a great time, just you know having fun. So. Yeah, your book says in the it's a quote says fear is a pharmaceutical industry's best friend, and uh, I think that still holds true. A lot of the commercials that you see on television now are more geared towards fear, fear of not being able to function sexually, fear of depression, which I know you so uh, psychotropic uh, drugs, but again, it's all based on fear, and that just seems like what people tend to um, gravitate towards. Um, I remember when I was in the industry, we wanted to catch doctors really early. And uh, one of the things your book brought up for me is um, and when I would sit in the hospital uh, meeting room where the doctors would come through, the new doctors would come through. We would always be so giddy kind of to see them because we knew that they were the new ones and we could get them early and kind of influence them to um, prescribe our drugs. But um, I remember having a conversation with another rep who was representing another uh, dr- drug at the time, and uh, she told me that doctors didn't receive a lot of nutritional education, which at that time really didn't mean a lot to me because I was in there to sell my drugs. But your book says that doctors on average only receive about, um, don't receive a lot of of nutritional training. And and I'm wondering, is this by design? Do you think this is by design? (laughs) Well, I don't, I don't want to get into any conspiracy theories, but uh, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 but I, I believe it is done so because, um, you know, in, in my book, I think I wrote it either in the introduction. I forgot. I think it was in the introduction where one of my buddies, he just you know, three years ago, he graduated from med school and he admittedly said to me that he only received eight hours of training in yeah. nutrition and it was sponsored by a pharmaceutical company. And the main point throughout the entire eight hours was that, nutritional modification doesn't work. That's why pharmaceutical intervention is necessary. And I thought, oh, my God, my head won't explode because I'm a nutritionist and I've seen so many people, you know, put their health issues into remission and completely reverse whatever they got going on, you know, with a lot of work, with a lot of improvement the diet and herbal formulas and including that. But I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, pharmaceutical intervention, that's what you believe in. And it's, it's a dogma. You know, when you go to a school, you're investing a lot of money. And for medical doctors, they, they invest a lot of money. It's nearly a quarter million dollars. And, you know, if you're putting in that much money, you're going to want to grasp and hold on to whatever knowledge you are presented in that curriculum because it's worth a lot of money. And if you were to go through your entire graduate career not believing a single thing, you know, you would – probably go crazy or you probably were crazy because you've got to believe in what you're learning and you have to have a passion. And and most medical students do. They have the passion to help people. Unfortunately, they're being presented the, you know, pharmaceutical intervention as first line therapy or the first thing that should be addressed where, you know, you and I both know it's like, no, let's work on the diet. Let's work on exercise. And so I think, you know, it, it is designed it is designed with that intention to steer medical doctors into a particular dogma. But at the same time, these docs are all, you know, they have a free will and I have a lot of colleagues who have gone beyond their medical degree now to learn about the paleo diet or paleolithic primal diets, Mm -hmm. you know, learn about Weston price and acupuncture and chiropractic and everything else that's considered holistic in terms of helping others support their healing process. So, yeah, you know, it's you, you kind of want to think when, as soon as they step into med school, they are stuck, you know. They're in this paradigm, and, and that's the case for some, absolutely. 
Yeah, I would definitely agree with you. Um, how much is does that intertwining go? Um, because the doctors are in medical school, and what I used to see was a lot of the continuing education courses were also intertwined or sponsored by the pharmaceutical company. So it's like the doctors kind of want to break free, but they they can't break free because it seems like there's so much um, symbiosis going on, if I can use that word, where mm-hmm. so much is sponsored by the pharmaceutical company, and it's like this this ever – um, in ever ch- non changing influence over doctors' heads, like it's always constantly raining over their heads. But again, the pharmaceutical industry is kind of sponsoring everything. How much, how, how is that affecting the, the medical industry? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, uh, it's crazy because you know, once you're in medical school, all these companies are going at you and they're giving you free devices, pens, notebooks, backpacks. They're all branded with the company names, with the drug name. And so while they're in medical school, they're, they're really just getting advertised so aggressively to the point when once they graduate and they go into practice, then they have the, the drug reps bring in pens and pads, clocks, umbrellas, um, you know, patient folders, just things with their drug names so that you're constantly being reminded of them. And then, and then when you go get off of work, you go to dinner and you're having dinner with a drug rep who can fit, foot the bill, you know, for a $500 meal. And then you're hearing the next commercial. And then you go to a weekend seminar for continuing med, med, continuing med, medical education units, you know, to maintain your licensure every year and you're hearing the next hour long commercial about how other people are prescribing different drugs. And then you go back to sleep and you start dreaming about drugs, you know, and it's an ongoing support. And it's interesting because you'll see some medical doctors realize this early and they'll say, I'm never going to interact with a pharmaceutical sales rep, but then they go to a CME lecture, you know, continuing medical education lecture because they need to maintain their license. And they don't realize that, a lot of these CME lectures are, you know, organized by drug companies or drug reps. Um, you know, statistically, you can see there's uh, close to two thirds of them are, and so it's very difficult for these doctors who are practicing medicine to step outside of the system and take a breather and see the benefits of what you and I do, you know, or what our holistic healthcare counterparts do. And and the same is for your listeners. You know, if if you look at just the average consumer. You know, you can go to a, you know, an area, an office of some sort, whether it's an accounting office or dentist's office, and you'll see in the magazine, and you'll find that there's pharmaceutical advertisements in the magazine. You'll see there's pharmaceutical advertisements on now bus stops, on actual buses, you know, for certain vaccines. I saw one the other day. And then on television during prime time, it literally – it, it, to me, it feels like it's a commercial for a drug advertisement, then a commercial for processed food advertisement, then an advertisement for another drug, and then another processed food, and so on. And you start to see that even patients are feeling like this is my only option, that I can only use drugs to address my issues just the same way that medical doctors are in their career. So it, it's tough to break away. Um, you know, the, the first step, what I suggest people to do is um, turn off your TV, you know, just don't watch as much TV and um, choose to read what you want to read, but not from a magazine, which is oftentimes filled with advertisements. And, and for practitioners out there, it's kind of like start talking to colleagues who get healing results through holistic human modalities. And, and it's when we take that step back, maybe meditate a little, then people can kind of step out. But, as of this moment, you're absolutely right. The system is kind of rigged, so once you're in it, it's hard to get out. It's kind of like a gang, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> I, would, I would definitely say that. You can't get out once you once you get in. Once you initiate it, it's, it's real hard to, to get out of that. Um, one of the things I quickly learned in allopathic medicine was, obviously, when you're looking at a lot of different things, and because you have to study so much, I remember how intense the training was, before I even got out into the field. But looking back on it now and having to study a whole package insert, learn all the indications for the drugs that I was representing, um, I realized that 
in most cases, the benefit always outweighed the risk. And the pharmaceutical industry kind of looks at that as, hey, we have these drugs, they're helping people, there's a benefit to them. But then again, we may have these uh, side effects. Talk about that a little bit and how that might um, affect uh, people. Yeah, you know, it's, it's fun because every drug, Every known drug, and, and for any of your listeners, they can actually go on to Hippocrates.com and they can mm-hmm. log on and look up whatever drug they're taking or whatever drug a, a loved one is taking or even a drug that a medical doctor is recommending. You can actually go on Hippocrates.com and look up the known side effects for those drugs. Um, so it's really important to know that every drug has side effects. Uh, and, and, you know, you and I may, I know I did. But I would, I would joke with docs saying that if it doesn't have side effects, it's not a drug. You know, mm-hmm. it's a placebo. It's something that doesn't work. So with that, the medical, you know, the pharmaceutical companies have to convince the, the consumer that there is no better option. And in doing so, they created this phrase that uh, the benefits outweigh the risk, meaning that if you take the drug, the benefits are going to be better than whatever side effects you could potentially get or what other diseases you may potentially develop from that particular medication. But the question I want your listeners to really think about is, what if there are solutions to your health issues that just have the benefits and don't have the risks? Wouldn't you rather take that particular option or that road towards improving your health than going down a road where you take a drug that does have risks because all of them do have known side effects. So that's just something I want you to think about. And, you know, I, I had a personal case where, um, you know, my mother, when I was 17, passed away, and she had a whole, you know, cocktail of various pharmaceuticals, and, you know, they put on chemotherapy, and, you know, they, they were always telling her, hey, the benefits outweigh the risks, the benefits outweigh the risks. And unfortunately, I was 17 years old, and, you know, my, my brother, who was, two years younger than me, my sister, three years younger than me, they, you know, we all lost someone who was very special and dear to us at a very impressionable time. And, um, you know, nobody needs to go through what we had to go through. Nobody needs to lose a loved one prematurely. And, you know, maybe if she was shared options to improve her health that didn't have such risk, maybe she might be, she might still be here, you know, And, and it's hard to say, but that's not something that, I can change, you know, no one can change at this moment. But the idea is just remember that, you know, if the out, if the benefits outweigh the risks, why not go look for another option where you just have the benefits and none of the risks. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry I hear about your mom as well. I lost my mom too. So I know exactly how you feel. Um, you talked about the major risks of taking pharma drugs. And um, one of the things that came up, uh, it's three major risks from your book, addiction, and then I wanted you to kind of maybe expand on the kidneys and liver. But just on the, the front of addiction, we just had, um, I guess, a music icon uh, die, Prince. And it was, mm. I don't know how true it is, but they were said he, they, they said he had an opiate addiction. So um, that can come about, especially with those types of drugs, you know, the, the drugs that are on schedule, so to speak. But um, talk a little bit about the kidneys and the liver and how they kind of are affected by by these pharmaceutical drugs. Yeah, yeah. One of the one of the major issues I see in my clinic is that I'll see a lot of people um, where on on a blood work I'll see their eGFR, which is indi- indicative of the health of you know the kidneys, and I'll see that number start to to drop. Um, you know, medical doctors wait until it's roughly below 15 and then they recommend dialysis which you and i know that dialysis is not really a high quality lifestyle that you're living and i'll see a lot of people on you know specific blood pressure lowering medications start to have a gradual decline in their kidneys and the reason is that a lot of these blood pressure lowering medications are known as diuretics you know, so if you think about what is a diuretic, well, coffee is a diuretic, tea is a diuretic, and but these drugs that are diuretics are are essentially trying to dehydrate the the person because the medical doctor believes that 
um, you know, water, too much water in the blood volume, creating too much blood volume, then uh, increases the blood pressure. And so they have to then prescribe this diuretic drug to dehydrate the patient. Um, and so what these drugs do is they go and they tell the kidneys, hey, we're going to force you to throw out more water that, uh, th- that you probably might need, but we're going to tell you to just excrete more water so we can drop down the blood pressure. And, and these, these drugs sometimes get stuck in the kidneys, and sometimes they're, um, and a lot of it's detox through the kidneys, but then these kidneys get overworked. And the way you know that they're getting overworked is when you start to see deterioration of the, the kidneys through the blood work. Um, you know, or maybe they feel like swollen in their kidneys. It's just like, oh, my kidney is aching on my left side or my right side. Um, sometimes if they have edema, um, you, can, you can probably associate something's going on with the kidneys or maybe even the adrenals that are attached to the kidneys. And so it's important that your listeners realize that a lot of these drugs are actual chemicals and the body only wants to do one thing when chemicals get into the body and that is to excrete it. So number one is going to try to excrete it and the, the two primary detox organs are the liver as well as the kidneys. You know, we urinate all the time. We're on average making about a drop of urine per minute. So everyone is currently removing either byproducts or you know, certain metabolites and chemicals through the urine. Um, people who have burning urine, you know, you can assume that perhaps there's other health problems related to your kidneys or your urethra, et cetera. And then people who have problems with detoxing the liver may have bowel issues. They may have constipation. They may have nausea, things that are related to liver gallbladder. They may not be able to digest fat properly. So they're either burping or have hiccups a little bit more than the average person. You know, um, another detox organ is the skin. We, we, uh, we sweat, um, but when someone has something like, let's say, a rash or hives, um, you can kind of think of now they're trying to detox through the skin because the liver and the kidneys are having challenges removing those toxins from inside the body. We also know that the lungs remove toxins and will you know, remove some drugs because if you think about it, uh, you know, the, the, I guess the check stops, the DUI check stops, they use a breathalyzer. So we know that we detox certain things such as carbon dioxide, but also even alcohol through our lungs. And we can even detox some other things um, that our body doesn't need. But most drugs are removed via the liver and the kidneys. And, um, you know, you and I learned by our former employers that the CYP450 enzymes are highly dense, you know, there are a lot of, there's a lot of those specific enzymes in the liver, and then those are responsible, responsible for metabolizing and preparing for excretion a lot of these common pharmaceuticals. The problem is a lot of these pharmaceuticals actually stop those enzymes from excreting those drugs as well as other toxins, and so over time, if someone gets on too many pharmaceuticals or gets on the wrong combination of pharmaceuticals, then there's a potential for a drug to drug interaction. There's potential for, um, you know, I guess less, uh, a weaker ability to detox environmental toxins, you know, because there's not only drugs and pharmaceuticals that people are exposed to, but there's toxins in the food and the air and the water, you know, for example, perfumes and colognes, those have carcinogens in them that known as phthalates. Um, you know, if someone's around perfumes and, colognes and they get irritated, irritated by it, then most likely they have problems with their detox organs and need some additional support. So, you know, that's kind of the long answer, um, but drugs and they do fall in the categories of chemicals and the liver and the kidneys are the majority, uh, are the major organs that are detoxing these, these chemicals out of the body. Yeah, that's very important because a lot of people already have um, what I would call low liver function. And some people mm-hmm. have already low kidney function, and then they're already, you know, they're taking these pharmaceutical drugs without knowing that it's going to kind of slow everything down even more. Um, I remember when I used to call on doctors and do all my detailing, one of the things that I would always make sure my doctor did was make sure that patients were compliant. I would give him suggestions on how to make patients compliant. Talk about compliancy and how doctors do that to maintain that, you know, patients are taking their, their drugs. Oh, man, yeah. 
Yeah, you and I probably did our job <laughs> too too good, so we kept people yeah. sick. <laughs> oh, okay, so certain tactics, you know, they would say is, um, oh, hey, this drug is making you agitated. Well, take it in the morning because then you're up, you know, you're up and about doing things. So, uh, oh, this drug is, you know, making you sedated or drowsy. Well, then take this drug at night so that you can fall asleep more easily. You know, so sometimes they will use the side effects to help the person address whatever health issues they have or, to, you know, they'll use it accordingly to keep them compliant. Sometimes what they'll do is they'll back up on the dose. They'll drop it down to a quarter of the amount or half of the amount, and they'll say, stay here and take it for a week and then get up to the next dose in a week later. And, you know, sometimes that works. And unfortunately, what happens is people start to learn how to live with these side effects. They don't necessarily go away. And, and so it's important if you have, you know, if any of your listeners are out there thinking about, you know, like, hey, yeah, I've got this health issue that hasn't gone away since I've started the drug and I'm, I got used to it, you know, maybe it's time to look for another option. Um, and, and one thing I wanted to point out, for anybody who's taking a pharmaceutical, um, you know, for any dosage adjustment, always work with a prescribing physician because if you were to stop any of them, all of a sudden there's a high risk of withdrawal syndrome, which means if you stop the drug, your body could have already been addicted to it, mm-hmm. and it's difficult to cope without that drug in your system. Okay, so for anybody who's listening to that, just always make sure you go back to your prescribing physician. Now, going back to your original question, if someone gets a side effect, you know, what's, what's an option that the doctor does to help the patient remain compliant? Well, there's the last one. The last option is, they add another drug to suppress that side effect. And so, you, you know, they got this health issue because they were poorly nourished. They didn't have proper nutrition and exercise. And now they go get a drug. And then this drug, they develop from this first drug, they develop a side effect. And now they get a second drug. And, you know, you and I have seen it or heard about it. Then they'll develop another side effect from those two drugs or maybe even a disease and then they get the third drug and then they get the next diagnosis and then the fourth drug you know the other day I had someone come in and they were on 14 medications and I wanted to ask them like didn't you realize that the first 13 were not working something was wrong and you can't really you can't really stand somebody because they're not quite where we are in terms of how you know healthcare or or true healthcare paradigm works but you know, that's what's going on, and, and that's what docs do to keep people on these drugs. It's come in and see me if you've got a problem. I'll just prescribe another drug. Yeah, I live in South Florida. We have a large elderly population, and you more, more times than not, the elderly population is on more than, than one drug. Like you mentioned, 14 different drugs. That's That's pretty common for a lot of people down here in this area. Um, the last thing I wanted to just ask you about and then kind of – take an upswing, so to speak, and we're talking about uh, pharmaceutical drugs. But uh, you mentioned in this uh, iotrogenesis, and um, this is something that kind of came about, so to speak. Like, I remember when I was a kid, I would sit around and listen to my grandmother, and my grandmother would say, oh, I'm taking this drug, but I, I seem to think that this is causing something else, some other some other type of disease. Talk about what uh, iotrogenesis is and uh, why why we kind of need to look out for it. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's kind of interesting, and, and maybe you had the same experience with me when I was a drug rep. They never talked about this concept of iotrogenesis, where it, a drug can create a disease or the doctor can create the disease. They didn't talk about that concept because you know if you and I were promoting specific pharmaceuticals, we have to believe in our product. We have to believe that our drug can save the world. And that's how I, I truly believe that the products I was, I was selling could help thousands, if not millions of people. And, and so the term nitrogenesis is something that I discovered many years after I left the industry and I became a nutritional consultant and saw that many of my clients actually had not only – they had symptoms, but they also had health conditions – that were directly related to the pharmaceuticals that they were being prescribed. And, you know, the intuition that your grandmother had is the same intuition that a lot of your listeners have and that you and I now have, where, 
these chemicals, while they may suppress certain symptoms or, you know, manage certain diseases, there is that long-term potential of creating another disease down the road if we were to take them long-term. And, you know, there was a book published in 1962. It was called Drug-Induced Diseases. And, of course, before a book is actually published, there must be years of documented research to then be compiled into books. So the concept of a drug creating another disease existed well before 1962. And and that book back then was maybe 300 pages. If you get the 2010 edition of drug-induced diseases, it's over 1,000 pages thick. And, you know, you can just simply find it on Amazon or you can find it on Google. But it's a phenomenon that happens, and it's a, it's a phenomenon that I see in my clinic, um, and which is the reason why I have a lot of medical doctors partnered up with me so that I can get my clients to an appropriate person to then wean and you know, slowly guide people off of specific medications in the right order because um, they have to be done with that type of finesse. So. Uh, iatrogenesis is not fun. You know, nobody wants a drug-induced disease or a doctor-induced disease. It, it kind of reminds me of the movie. There was a, one, of the, one of the Batman movies where um, the Joker had, you know, had someone go, be placed into jail, the jail cell, and the guy's like, oh, my stomach hurts. There's something you got to look into. And they're like, no, shut up. You know, don't stop making trouble. And, and it was a cell phone. It was a cell phone in his stomach that eventually detonated. But the idea is that iatrogenesis is not only drug-induced disease, it could be drug-induced something, whatever. If someone went to a surgery and someone left a scalpel or a watch or a cell phone in someone's body and then sewed them up, that's also considered iatrogenesis. So um, it can come in all forms. And, you know, these things don't happen. The, the surgical ones don't happen often, but... Uh, I, w- I won't say that it doesn't happen at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, your book kind of reacquainted me um, back because sometimes you forget how important uh, nutrition is, and then you start to read a book like yours, and you go back to, okay, nutrition is really, really important. One of the things I, I, I saw that I thought was um, kind of alarming was that we used to have people who kind of, we're looking out for our food supply. Um, there was a gentleman, I uh, can't remember his name, um, but uh, they were looking, they were really looking out to make sure that we didn't have any preservatives or chemicals and kind of kept the food supply on um, what, you, what you would call unadulterated. Now it doesn't seem like we have that. What, what changed from, you know, several years ago to, to right now? Oh yeah. You know, that, um, the individual was named uh, Harvey Wiley, and yeah. he was the last. He was the last honest chairman of the FDA, I guess you could say, because of the Food and Drug Inter- you know, Administration. And you know, he he got pushed out of the system by the white flour companies. The the companies that actually bleached and refined refined the flour had invested so much money into this group that they said, we want him out. We want to be able to um, create food that have a long shelf life. And if we do not refine the foods and remove all the live enzymes and the nutrients that humans actually need for optimal health, if you don't allow us to remove that, our products can't stay on the shelves for a long time to enable us to make larger profits. And, and so they had already been generating money. It's like they already made, committed the fraud by selling these products. And now you had Harvey Wiley saying, like, no, we got to put a mandate on this. And unfortunately, since that time in 1907, we have seen through today a cons- that, that same exact pattern. We see now um, our grocery stores are filled with processed foods. So if you think of processed foods as anything that's in a bag, um, a box or a can, right? So anything in the middle of the grocery store. And and oftentimes you'll see the fresh stuff along the edges, right? The vegetables, the fruits, the dairy, the meat. Um, but we see now our grocery stores are probably 5% fresh stuff and 95% processed stuff. And, and this trend has even gotten worse today with the, um, the high amounts of genetic modified foods, 
um, genetically modified, genetically engineered. We see now that um, the DDT, back when Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring and the pesticides of DDT and many other toxic chemicals were sprayed in the air, we see that now again with glyphosate, also known as Roundup, that's now, you know, it's been confirmed it's carcinogenic. Um, you know, so we still see the poisoning of our society with these processed foods and then all these chemicals. And what we're seeing is the shift for people now eating local, people now starting to grow their own foods, people now shopping at the local farmer's markets and only choosing organic or foods that are grown from permaculture-based farms or biodynamic farms. And, and so we're seeing this collective shift because people demand, you know, they're demanding health and they demand what Harvey Wiley wanted, which was to have pure foods, you know, and unrefined whole foods that were, a lot of them were raw, fermented, sprouted, et cetera, you know, and, and these are the things that, that we, we all intuitively know we should get back to. Yeah. There were a number. Um, I'm always surprised at how, how many dentists are, are involved with this whole, I guess, pioneering of nutrition, uh, Melvin Page. And then um, you mentioned a gentleman who I wasn't familiar with was Royal Lee. And from the book I gauged that he was kind of the first, what you would call holistic nutritionist. And which seems like such a new term now, you know, everybody says holistic nutritionist, holistic nutritionist, but this gentleman was the holistic nutritionist before the actual holistic nutritionist. Talk a little bit about uh, Royal Lee and why he is, uh, he's, he's very important because I wouldn't have known this information without, you know, really reading your book. And I think right. the listeners need to know a lot more about this, this gentleman as well. Yeah. Um, so many of your listeners may already know who Dr. Weston A. Price is. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Weston A. Price, is, his information is very much widely discussed among, among everybody, among the consumers, among the non-patients out there. Dr. Roy Lee is very much discussed among the holistic healthcare practitioner circle. And, and the reason why is he was pretty much on the same wavelength as Dr. Weston A. Price. Dr. Price went and traveled, you know, across the entire world and studied over a hundred different societies where he found 14 of them had absolutely perfect health. And he, you know, he observed that they were consuming um, organ meats, you know, obviously from healthy animals and vegetables. And they were eating these fermented as well as raw. And then they also had locally well-crafted herbs. And then they had a, you know, a, a bone setter or someone like a chiropractor or acupuncturist or shaman, you know, a, a massage therapist. And, and then they were always moving. They always exercised. And so Dr. Weston A. Price studied them. And Roy Lee was actually in dental school the same time that Weston A. Price was traveling and studying these societies. And Dr. Roy Lee wrote a thesis on the connection between cavities in the teeth and poor nutrition. And it wasn't just eating too much sugar. It was to the point where, and you'll know there are many um, holistic dentists out there, if there's a cavity on a particular tooth, and depending on the part of the tooth, if it's more at the root or more towards the outside, you can then assess that there's a, you can then identify where the malnutrition is taking place because the specific tooth be correlated to the liver or the eyes or the kidneys. And, and so it was used as an assessment tool. And that's what Weston A. Price used, and that's also what Dr. Roy Lee was using. Now, Dr. Roy Lee was an inventor, and he was able to create equipment to create the first whole food supplement. And, and the thing is, he made this supplement um, in 1929, prior to the discovery of all the most commonly known vitamins. So, for example, in 1929, he, he put in there alfalfa, he put in pea vine juice, he put in, um, you know, adrenal glands and liver, because liver is like one of the most nutrient-dense foods. And, and then vitamin C was discovered in, you know, and made available synthetically in 1931. And then vitamin D and vitamin E were discovered in 1933. So, he made this multiple food concentrate supplement based on the research he had came up with and as well as the information Weston A. Price came up with. And a lot of those foods and the formulas that Dr. Roy Lee then created from there were coming from 
this knowledge that price found because a lot of, you know, for me, a lot of my clients are not willing to go back and eat liver the way that our grandmothers used to eat liver. And, and so then when we can give it to them in the form of a concentrated tablet, then they start to re-nourish their bodies with the nutrition that the liver has and, and also the other vegetables too. So sometimes people aren't eating enough vegetables and, and it's pretty amazing that he then created an entire uh, formula line that I use and a lot of my colleagues use to feed today's people, today's modern people who are filled with processed food, you know, byproducts and chemicals, and we feed them the nutrients that they've been missing for their entire lives, and maybe sometimes even generations, like sometimes even their parents didn't eat this, eat, eat as well as they should have. And that's one of the reasons why we can see some of these problems due to malnutrition disappear. Um, but Royal Lee was, was, a, was a huge advocate of making sure that we consume whole foods. And, you know, and that was the, the fight that he fought. Um, and it's similar to what you see today with what you're doing, what I'm doing, what Mike Adams, the health ranger, is doing, Joseph Mercola, what he's doing. You know, we're, we're all kind of doing the same thing. Um, you know, sharing the same mission and just taking a part of it. Yeah. Um, last two questions for you, Gerald. Um, there was a time I remember when I first – cable first became digital, and I was sitting down, and the uh, first time I got to uh, – I was at my mom's house. This was wild whack. And you can you could go to anything that you wanted to go to and watch it on demand is what it's called. And I remember watching this exercise channel, and I was watching the exercise channel, and it said that detoxification wasn't necessary because our bodies actually detoxificate themselves. So no additional detox was necessary. Is that true? Does that hold true today? Oh, man. <laughs> well, you know, th- there was a time when doctors recommended camel cigarettes. <laughs> you know, yeah. There was a time when doctors said that butter was bad and margarine was good in margarine, you know, most of your listeners already know is trans fats. You know, there was a time when, you know, it was safe to ride a bicycle without a helmet and drive a car without seatbelts. So, you know, the, the times have changed and, and it, it was always safe to drive a car with a seatbelt. It was always safe to ride a helmet, uh, to wear a helmet when you ride your bicycle. It, it's just now the information has caught up with the intuition, you know? And so for anybody who's listening and says, you know, I always thought I needed more support to detox or remove the chemicals that have been stored in my body that I've taken in from my environment, you know, that intuition needs to be listened to. And it's absolutely true that today we are exposed to way more chemicals than our ancestors were. And, you know, one example is there's, the gasoline used to be leaded, and at some point, I think it was in the 80s, some point, where the gasoline became unleaded, and they took out the lead because it was going into the air, and humans were breathing it in. So once we breathe it in, it's not always as simple as, well, it's going to come out naturally. Um, sometimes this stuff gets stuck into in our tissues, in our organs, and then it prevents us from functioning optimally. So absolutely today – improving your detox capacities with additional herbal support, nutritional, maybe even some coffee enemas, some massage, even exercise, moving the lymph. All of these things are necessary more so today than they were even just 30 years ago. Yeah. I wanted to get that in because I know I still hear people like, oh, I I mean, you see Facebook things uh, tossed around all day and people say, is this detox necessary? I'm like, come on. (laughs) <laughs> all the stuff that we, all the stuff that we are encountering now, you think that you don't need to detox. Uh, last question. Um, there is what we call a standard of care. And you see this with insurance companies. You see this obviously with the medical establishment. They want to maintain the standard, standard of care. Is the standard of care keeping our healthcare system in a, in a crisis state? Yeah. Um, if I say yes, then it sounds, makes me sound a little bit like a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> mm-hmm. But what I'd like to say is this, is that each and every one of us has the option to choose what kind of system for healthcare we live in. 
And what I choose for myself is to have a high deductible catastrophic type of insurance policy. So if I'm ever in a car accident, I can then go to the hospital and not worry about, you know, an expensive bill that includes all kinds of surgery. You know, if I'm in a car accident and my leg is ripped apart from me and it's 20 yards away, yeah, send me to the hospital. But then after I'm out of the hospital, I'm going to my acupuncturist, my chiropractor, my nutritionist, because even though I'm a nutritionist, I always see a colleague. You know, it's always best to see, uh, get a third, third person to look at you. And, and I'll go and get my nutrition protocol and program updated and, you know, I'll go see my other colleagues who have all kinds of additional healing modalities from, you know, Reiki to Qigong to the reconnection, reconnected healing, you know, and et cetera. And I'm going to go and build that as my model, and I will be paying them cash fee for service. Because the problem with health insurance is that if I can pay the practitioners directly, there is no wastage. Health insurance companies are like a third-party broker. You pay them $100 and then you get go see the doctor, and then the insurance company pays that doctor $20. And then where does that $80 go? The difference. It goes to the third party, the middleman. And so this is a fee-for-service type of model that, that I implement locally in my hometown, and it's something that we can, you know, we can choose for ourselves. Now, I understand that some people don't necessarily subscribe to that model, but the standard of care is it's a system. It's ran by for-profit entities, and in doing so, they have a priority to their investors as number one, and, and then number two, their customers. And so at any point, you, your health is taking a back seat to someone else. You have to think about restructuring you know, your healthcare system. And you know, I think the, the easiest solution is for all pharmaceutical companies and health insurance companies to immediately immediately become nonprofit entities. Like if that were to happen, you know, the insurance companies are like, okay, we're no longer uh, focused on making a profit and drug companies do the same. I think we would have a much more fair and open healthcare system where people have more options to choose, you know, nutrition first, herbs first, or acupuncture, chiropractic first. And, and unfortunately, we just don't have that. So, yeah, that's, standard of care is, is just their way of saying this is a standard, which unfortunately doesn't have to apply to you. Yeah, I've always had that little conflict where, you know, I'm paying for insurance and it's like, okay, especially when you're working for a corporate entity and it's like, okay, you they're taking money from me every two weeks. And <clears throat> I'm like, okay, um, I want to go see this alternative physician, but I can't, <laughs> you know, so, right. It's like if you're taking money from me, I should be able to go see whoever I want to see, but it's like I can only see who you want me to see. So there's not much of a choice there. But, uh, exactly. Gerald, man, it, it was a pleasure, man, especially to be able to speak with someone who had the same or similar experience as I did. And your book is available on Amazon, correct? Correct, yeah. Your listeners can go to thepharmaceuticalmyth.com or the healing body. Yep. And I didn't get it. I didn't even really skim the surface of the questions I had. I probably could have kept you for two hours, but I normally only keep people for an hour, but Hey man, thank you so much for uh, doing the interview and, and really enjoyed the book. And I really enjoyed speaking with you. Same here, Darren. Keep up the awesome work. All right. Thank you, man. Have a good night. All right, have a good evening. All right. All right. Good show tonight. Hopefully you enjoyed what I would call pharmaceutical week in which, again, we got to speak with Gwen Olson on Monday. Gwen was a former pharmaceutical rep, and I shared some experiences with her, and tonight I shared some experience with uh, Gerald uh, about the pharmaceutical industry and really just try to maybe keep it on the upswing of solutions and things that you can do and what you really need to look out for and educate yourself because it's all about really educating yourself and making the best decision as it applies to you, not trying to tell you what to do, but again, it's always nice to be educated because a lot of people don't realize that they have options. So um, next week, I'm not really sure if I'm going to have a guest. Uh, next month is going to be um, maybe like a little uh, skeleton month, just simply because um, there's some things that I'm going to be doing. I'm actually going to be start uh, working again and uh, doing some different things. So I'm um, not sure if I'm going to have someone on next week. I know that um, the week after uh, there's a possibility of two guests, 
but um, there will be shows, and, uh, and really, um, I got to get acclimated to things that I'm doing in my life, and then in September, we'll get back to the two-a-day shows, but for August, uh, just simply because a lot of people go on vacation in August, a lot of things are happening in August, uh, we might be just doing one show a week, and there might be some shows that are missing, so just wanted to get, get give you a heads up for that and let you know that that's probably coming down the pipe. So again, thanks for listening. Peace and love, y'all. Always see the same fat time, same fat channel, but that won't be next week, or maybe it might. But um, peace and love again. Good night, y'all. Sure, you're healthy now, but health insurance isn't about now. It's about being covered for the unexpected. When an accident or injury happens, the last thing you should worry about is how to pay for your health care. GetCovered.nj.gov can help you find an affordable plan that's right for you. You may even be eligible for financial assistance. But remember, open enrollment ends December 15th. So visit GetCovered.nj.gov and find a health plan that keeps you covered, no matter what life throws at you. North Pole Hotline, Mrs. Claus here. My holiday shopping list is so big, I can't wait for Black Friday. Get to Old Navy's biggest sale of the year now. Old Navy? Beat the crowds for 50% off your entire purchase. 50% off? Plus, today only, Old Navy's famous cozy socks are just a buck in stores. Old Navy's giving $1 for every pair sold up to a million dollars to boys and girls clubs. So I can do good, look good, and get 50% off your entire purchase at Old Navy and OldNavy.com. Valid 1121 to 1123. Exclusions apply. See store for details. Cozy socks valid 1123 in stores only. Limit 10.